Okay, I think that's most people in, so we will make a start. Uh, welcome to this Farm Advisory Service webinar tonight. This is the second in a series of the Mineral Requirements webinars with uh, Dr. Annie Williams, who is a independent advisor in minerals for ruminants. Tonight, Annie is going to discuss mineral requirements in house cattle. Um, and just a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions, please put it in the Q&A box, which should appear at the bottom of your screen, and we will go through the questions at the end. OK, I'll hand over to you, Annie. Thanks, everybody, for joining tonight. So I'm going to talk about mineral nutrition specifically in house cattle, and I'll come on to a little bit of why we chose that topic in a bit. But I just want to go through some of the basics. I'm definitely not going to go through every mineral that cows require in lots of detail tonight and the reason why they require them uh, because we did that in a webinar last year looking at mineral nutrition of cattle more generally where I covered some of those macro minerals some of the trace elements and I think that's available on YouTube if you want to find it uh, what I'm going to do tonight is look at mineral nutrition specifically in housed cattle look at some of the, the pitfalls that we see in dairy and some of those that we see across the beef sector because they are quite different in terms of problems that I see on farm related to minerals. I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the current research and also some of the potentially things that I think are going to come in in terms of pressures on mineral nutrition ideas around phosphorus excretion, phosphorus balances, some challenges that we've got with some oversupply, certainly in the dairy industry of certain minerals, and possibly a little bit of some undersupply in the beef industry. But to start with, why do cows actually need minerals? And there's lots of reasons. They function as part of the body's vital processes. So physiologically, the cow to function as normal, to be healthy, to be productive, whether that's to grow, whether that is to reproduce, whether that is to yield milk, to be fertile, all those things require a mineral at some stage within the body. So to, to make those processes happen, we need the cows to be of optimum mineral status. And I'll talk a little bit about what we mean by optimum mineral status and what we mean by a cow's requirement for mineral um, soon, because I think that's quite a complex question. And one of the questions that I get asked quite regularly is how certain are we about what minerals a cow's required? And that's, that's also quite a complex question that I'll try and sort of untangle some of the data that we've got on that area in this webinar tonight. But I always, in everything that I do, every talk that I give, need to get across that mineral nutrition is a balance. So I'm going to talk about oversupply tonight. I'm going to talk about undersupply. Effectively, what we're trying to find is that balance. We're trying to meet what that animal needs in order to function as physiologically normal. We also might talk a little bit, and I'm going to mention some minerals where we might get a performance response if we supply a little bit more of that mineral. So it's not necessarily that the cow needs that, but we might be able to yield some sort of response. But the areas on this graph that we really want to avoid is that oversupply of and risk of toxicity and also that undersupply and risk of deficiency. And I think probably some differences across sector that we can identify is that certainly in beef cattle, what we're most likely to see is an undersupply and therefore a risk of deficiency. Whereas in dairy cows, what we're most likely to see is an oversupply and a risk of toxicity. Now, those risks vary massively depending on the mineral. So if you think of this curve as it could be really, really steep or it could be quite a broad curve, depending on the mineral, we're pretty close to mapping out why mineral nutrition is so difficult to balance. So in terms of if we were thinking of a mineral that has a really steep curve and therefore requirement is quite close to toxicity, that would be something like copper. 
which is why I think we see some of the challenges across the industry that we do in copper nutrition. Whereas if we think of a mineral which is such as much broader, where our, say, requirement is much, much further away from toxicity, that would be something like cobalt. So we've got a, a range of minerals within that, and therefore the dangers of oversupply, undersupply differ depending on the mineral that we're talking about. But for all of them, no matter how steep or shallow this curve is, what we're always trying to achieve is a balance. I want all the cows within that herd to have an adequate supply to function in terms of all the things that they need mineral for. But I don't want to risk undersupplying for some of them. And I don't want to risk oversupplying for some of them, especially for those minerals where if we oversupply, we might have a negative impact on performance or we might have negative impacts like environmental um, excretion. Or if we undersupply, we might start to physiologically affect that animal in terms of it, its ability to function in health, in fertility. So I really want to yeah get that point across that I'm, though I'm going to talk about these two extremes that we see, what we're really trying to achieve is a balance and meeting requirement and maybe for some looking towards a mineral response. So why have we chosen to talk specifically about cattle in-house systems? So Cara and I sort of battered some ideas around about what we were going to talk about. Where do we see some of the issues? Where is current research going to try and break down what we were going to do in terms of webinars? And what we decided is that we'd run one in terms of cows on house systems and one on more extensive looking at outwintering, because I think the challenges within those systems are quite different in terms of obviously the way that those animals are fed. The ability to supplement within those systems is really variable. And we see we certainly see different challenges from feeding cattle indoors versus feeding cattle outdoors. So theoretically, in a house system, we should have greater control of the diet. So we should be able to look at exactly how much that cow is intaking per day. Obviously, that is variable depending on if we're a dairy unit, how much are we splitting groups? So are we splitting dry cows and milking cows? Have we got an ability to actually split early lactation from mid and late lactation? How precise can we do that nutrition obviously has an impact, but we should theoretically have greater control of the diet on that sort of house system than we would if they were grazing more extensively. The downside to that is the cows have no choice. The diet doesn't vary. They have to eat what we put in front of them. So what that means is if we haven't formulated correctly or say from the last side, if our mineral balance is out, that has a cumulative effect because that cow is getting that same diet every day. So if we've got a little bit too much copper in that diet and she's getting it throughout her whole lactation, then that effect of increased copper in the diet is cumulative throughout that lactation. Whereas perhaps if they were out grazing, we would say see natural fluctuations throughout the season in terms of minerals that the cow has access to anyway. I mean, clearly this depends on how stable your diet is. Differences between silage cuts is always a challenge. How frequently we're analysing that silage. Do we know the difference between the first and the third cut? There's there's some generalisations being made there, but that's certainly potentially an advantage of an indoor house system, potentially a disadvantage if we don't get it right. The other thing is that we can basically use any type of supplementation within a house system. So we could feed via TMR, we could feed via concentrate, we can do um, injectables, boluses, drenches. We could, we've got the ability to, to do any of those supplementation methods within a house system which again should be advantageous, but I think sometimes leads us down the path where we're actually oversupplying some mineral because we've got it coming in from lots of different sources 
The other challenge, of course, is whether the ration formulated is the ration fed and is the ration consumed and making sure that when we're certainly when we're doing precision nutrition of minerals and we're formulating down to the milligram in order to do that, that actually that is what the cow is eating and making sure that we're going back and we're doing the due diligence to say, OK, this is what we formulated. But practically, is this what we're seeing and doing on farm? So just quickly, um, minerals for cattle, like I say, I'm not going to go through their requirements in massive detail. That was covered in another webinar. Um, but this is how we would split them into macro minerals. So required in grams per kilogram dry matter. That would also include your electrolytes. So we're talking sodium, potassium, the, the balance of pH within the blood would come under that. And then we've got the trace elements required in milligrams per kilogram dry matter and some essential tra trace elements within that. So I'm going to pick out a few of those where I see um, maybe a change in some of the science that's available or where we are seeing definite problems on farm or where I think there's specific requirements in house systems which may differ to if we're grazing or out wintering. So the question I always get asked is how sure are you that what you're formulating is the cattle the requirement and the most annoying answer is it depends because uh, it really does. How sure we are depends on the mineral and on the cow. So what do I actually mean by that? A lot of the mineral research that we're using is still old research. So a lot of how we actually identify what is the mineral requirement of a dairy cow or what is the mineral requirement of a beef cow is research that was done in the 70s and 80s. And there's a few reasons for that. The primary reason is actually doing those mineral metabolic studies is really expensive. So to actually be able to identify the metabolism and the absorption of how the cow is actually absorbing the mineral that we're feeding to her is an extremely expensive study to run. So people haven't done much of it in the past 20, 30 years. So a lot of what we're relying on is old data. That doesn't mean we haven't made any steps forward. We absolutely have. In certain minerals, we definitely have. And in certain minerals, we are now able to say, we are as certain as you can be, that this is the requirement of the cow. So if we go, if we take those say trace elements that I showed on the previous slide, for copper and zinc, we are certain that, that that what we have written in our textbooks is the requirement of the cow. We've got enough data basically through enough scientific research to say this is definitely what they require. And what do I mean by require? By require, I mean that that is what it, the amount of mineral that it takes for the cow to be physiologically normal. Now there's some assumptions within that because when we're talking about the requirement of those animals, we're assuming that when we go to feed that diet, that that animal is healthy and is already of normal status. So we're assuming they don't have a mineral deficiency. They don't have any underlying disease. There's no issues sort of going on in there that she is normal. And therefore, if we feed her the normal amount, then she will be physiologically normal, which are obviously when we actually start to break that down, quite big assumptions that we're that we're making there when we're formulating these diets. Now, also, so the new um, NASM, which was previously NRC requirements, came out for dairy cows in two thousand and twenty one. No new requirements for beef cattle at the moment, but when we're looking at those textbooks and those requirements. What we're actually looking at is the requirement for the average cow. So that effectively means if you fed that diet just out of the textbook, 
you would meet the requirement for 50 percent of the cows in that herd because you're meeting average requirement what we actually need to look at when we're formulating is how do we meet the requirement of most or if not all of the cows in that herd so when we're formulating we need to think okay this is a number that will meet 50 percent we actually need to add more to make sure that we're getting the rest of the cows that are have an above average requirement within that herd so like i say some minerals we are really confident about and some minerals we're less confident about so those minerals that we're confident that we've got enough data, we call that a requirement. Those minerals where we're less confident, there is still data, but ha perhaps it's not as comprehensive. We give a, a value of adequate intake. So that is basically an indication of confidence. Requirement, we're really sure. An adequate intake, not quite as much data, not quite as sure. And then we add response in there. And response is probably something that not we didn't talk about that long ago. And we're still we're starting to talk a little bit more about response with minerals a lot more, especially when it becomes to these high performing animals. So to these high yielding dairy cows or rapidly growing beef cattle that are doing uh, rapid daily live weight gain talking about can we actually get a response in those animals from mineral so response and a response intake is basically where there may be some benefit to supplying that mineral above the physiologically normal requirement so it's not that you add that it's not that you have to it's not that you wouldn't have a healthy cow if you didn't supply that mineral in that way, but there may be some advantage to supplying more or changing the balance of it when we're talking about things like electrolytes and DCAD. It might, it, when we come to supplying more, one of the ones that's being looked at is chromium and adding chromium into diets uh, to see if we can get a performance response in those cows from that. Now, What's really important to think about in that is if we do that, we need to balance that with the economics. Because in terms of those minerals where we know that we've got a requirement or we think this is the adequate intake, absolutely, we need to supply that requirement or supply that adequate intake. Otherwise, that cow is not going to be physiologically normal and therefore she's not healthy. When it comes to response, what we need to consider is, is increasing or changing the mineral balance, perhaps adding chromium in as a mineral, going to give us a response that is economically viable to add that mineral in. And that is a conversation that I'm having on individual farms, looking at individual uh, targets depending on contracts so uh, I've just not long come back from America where they're quite focused on things like milk solids and we know that we can change some milk solids and things by looking at different mineral balances over here we might look at milk solids we might look at milk yield we might look at daily live weight gain or we might look to say can we actually get a response in those things by changing or adding a certain mineral and if so, when we get that change, does it offset or give us a return on investment for what we've put in, in terms of that mineral? So how do we actually go about working out from those mineral requirements, from those adequate intakes, looking at response, what we're going to do on an individual herd basis? And where I would always start on farm would be a mineral audit. So I'd start by looking at probably the, the table on the, the screen looks fairly familiar as a, as a forage analysis. Ignore the red, blue, green, they mean nothing. Um, but I would start by looking at total diet and analysing my mineral inputs. So what is going into those cows in terms of diet, forage, concentrates, water, other supplements, supplements of absolutely any kind, what is the intake of those cows? 
on a daily basis and how much can we break that down so can we break that down in beef by age can we break that down by weight can we break that down in dairy by uh, point of lactation uh, dry cows young stock etc etc how, how much detail can we do that mineral audit in I would then look at antagonists in the diet so what we're seeing here is both those minerals required, but also those minerals that are that antagonize the absorption of other minerals into the cow. So well, what I want to know is of the minerals that I've got there, can, is there anything that's going to interfere with that process, which might mean that I need to change my mineral input in the first place. And then the final thing I want to know is what source is the mineral in? And I'm going to show some data as to why that's important in a minute. But I'm talking about source of the mineral in terms of supplement, which is what I'll show the data on. I'm also talking about source of the mineral in terms of the forage analysis. So what I really want to know is, is the mineral within my forage definitely available to the cow? And if it's not, then why is it not? If it's not, it's probably because we've got high levels of soil contamination and those minerals are present within soil. They're not actually in the silage itself. They're only there because it's contaminated with soil. And that can give us major um, issues in terms of balancing that mineral because it's not available to the cow, but also bringing in lots of antagonism with it. Now, there are other steps that we can do to look at mineral status on farm. So we can analyze, we can certainly analyze animal performance. I always say that everything that we're advising in terms of nutrition has to be practical on the farm, but also has to be a way we have to be know, knowing what we're looking at. What are we aiming for on this farm? Where do we want animals to be in terms of performance? Because that might alter actually some of the advice that I would give depending on what the, those key performance indicators were. Were there any that actually we thought this one's way behind? Are we doing great on um, daily live weight gain, but actually we're having issues with fertility? So what do we need to look at in terms of practically balancing on farm to really deliver impact? And we can also use veterinary diagnostics. So I do a lot of troubleshooting on farms that are having a specific issue. And I would often look to use diagnostics in those cases. So is the diet that we have audited, are the cows responding in the way that we would expect them to respond? And going back to what I was saying before, where we're formulating requirement, assuming that cows are of normal status. If we do some diagnostics that tell us those cows are actually of abnormal status, and that could be that their status is too low, it could be that their status is too high, we need to adjust for that. So we need to adjust and not just say, well, we're going to blanketly feed to the requirement or the adequate intake that the textbook tells us to we actually need to feed those cows based on what those diagnostics are telling us a lot of minerals that will be blood there are some minerals where uh, liver that analysis is definitely preferential it gives us much more information and much more information to go and make decisions over what we might change in the diet using those but just going back to the source of the mineral, so I covered a little bit on the forage and knowing where the mineral is coming from in that forage. It's also important that when we're supplementing, and there are so many different supplements on the market now, I completely uh, understand that it's really confusing and people use lots of different names for them. Uh, and I'd like to tell you they're all the same, but unfortunately they, they are not. Um, they are all quite different and the source of the mineral is definitely a consideration when we're looking at individual farms and what we're trying to achieve. So this is a paper that will be published this year looking at copper and the basically the O forms of copper are different to the N forms of copper. We don't need to massively worry about what they are, although I can tell people if they want to know. Um, 
the so what we can see is this is a graph showing how the liver copper changed through the study and these are fed at exactly the same level but what we've got is a different type of copper and we can see that those cows on this n treatment have changed positively in terms of their copper status through the the treatment whereas those on the o have responded differently so what we're seeing is that not all mineral sources are equal and cows will respond differently. Now, what I haven't covered um, in these slides, because we would genuinely be here for hours, is all the different sources of mineral that are available. Uh, but I do talk to farmers about those on individuals or nutritionists about those, about inorganic sources, organic sources, collated sources, yeasts because we're certainly seeing a growing body of evidence that there are big differences in terms of how they're metabolized and absorbed within the animal and how we might start to use those differently when we're formulating diets. So what I wanted to spend probably five, 10 minutes uh, talking about is some of the issues particularly that we see within, and it is really within cows, dairy cows on intakes of minerals being too high so there's lots of different papers i've just picked this one out so this was a paper published by liam sinclair at harper adams in 2014 that concluded that most dairy herds were feeding excess amounts of minerals over the winter feeding period when compared to national guidelines so, and I'm going to go through, I think, some of the minerals that I see certainly being overfed on farm and some of the reasons why we might want to start to change that. And although this research was done 10 years ago, I think we're still seeing similar things. We've definitely made some progress. There's certainly some minerals that are being pulled back across the dairy industry, but we, we're still definitely seeing some areas where we've got significant oversupply of certain minerals within dairy cow diets. I think we see something slightly different in beef. I don't tend, I don't tend to see so much oversupply within beef cattle, and I'll come on to some specifics around beef a little bit later. But actually what we tend to see is a little bit of undersupply into those cows. Now, when I talk about dairy, what I really want you to think about is the dairy cow all the way through from calf all the way to lactation and including her having her own calf. Because I think that's the bit where we sometimes forget that what how we treat them as calves and young stock is going to impact their mineral status all the way through their adult lives. And yes, there are things that we can do to change it and how much of an impact it has through their adult lives depends on the mineral itself. But I think a lot of our problems with oversupply in mineral are probably starting in young stock in dairy. And then we're carrying that through and, and still seeing problems within the milking herd. So why am I really against oversupply? There's three reasons primarily. One, because for a lot of minerals, it's really expensive. If we're adding mineral that doesn't need to be there, particularly if we're bringing mineral in in bags, on pallets, however we're getting that mineral delivered, and we've got significant amounts that we don't need, that's a really expensive way of doing it. Secondly, because we see effects on animal performance. So, and that again, depends on the mineral and I'll talk about a specific one where we definitely see effects on animal performance in a negative way from oversupply but th there's definitely a risk and that's where we need to recognize those minerals where like uh, going back to that mineral balance graph and this requirement adequate intake response we need to recognize those minerals where we're confident on requirement and we should not be oversupplying and identify those where actually the data is not so certain and we need to err on the side of caution and we need to potentially look at minerals where we might get a response and categorize them but certainly for copper you will affect animal performance if you oversupply and the last thing the reason is because of excretion into the environment so if we're supplying excess 
minerals to the animal again depending on the mineral and the metabolic pathway within that animal but using phosphorus for, as an example we will get excess excretion into feces and therefore express excess excretion into the environment at some stage i'm going to talk about some minerals that i see probably generally over supplemented and like I say, this is a generalization. In some ways, I think this situation has really improved on farm and we are starting to see people doing things about and monitoring their minerals more closely to avoid some of these things. But starting with phosphorus, because phosphorus is really expensive. So if you're feeding phosphorus in excess, there is definitely money to be saved there. But the primary reason why I want to look at phosphorus is because of the effect it has on the environment if it's excreted excessively. So we know that the response in terms of how much phosphorus a cow intakes is directly linked to how much she excretes. And phosphorus is one of those minerals where we're really sure about requirement. So we should be formulating as close to requirement as possible. Now, that's obviously complicated by the fact that some of the requirements are broken down to this is the requirement early lactation, mid lactation, late lactation, early dry cow, like far off dry cow, close up dry cow. And sometimes that's not practical on certain farms. So we have to look at what we can do practically to precisely formulate phosphorus as close to requirement as possible. And that will vary clearly between farms, but I definitely think that it's something we should all be looking at, making sure that you know how much phosphorus you're feeding and talking to your feed advisor, nutritionist, consultant, whoever that may be, about whether that is the correct amount. So aside from phosphorus, I wanted to just mention this paper that has just been published this year are investigating environmental excretion of some of those other trace elements. So this paper basically looked at uh, supplying trace elements in a control form or in a over oversupply. So supplying lots of the mineral into the diet. And we don't need to worry too much about the figures on this. And they looked at it in terms of intakes, in terms of milk. But what I'm really interested in is looking at it in terms of excretion. So how they measured that was looking at excretion into urine and excretion into feces. And when we look at these tables, what we can see is for some minerals, we get a dramatic increase in the excretion if we oversupply that mineral within the diet effectively. So that's either via urine or probably primarily via feces. And that is because that's the animal protecting itself. That's a uh, sort of loop that they've developed so that those minerals don't build up and cause a toxicity within the animal, that they're able to excrete some of that mineral because they um, have developed a process of getting rid of excess to protect the body, basically. Now, what we can see on this table is that varies depending on the mineral. So if we look at the fourth one down, which is manganese, we can see that in the feces, the control uh, cows are around 1,000 and the highly fed mineral cows are around 3,000. So those cows are excreting extra manganese within their feces. Now, importantly, what I wanted to point out here is when we look at copper, we see no difference. And that's because the metabolic pathway for copper is entirely different. What a cow will do with copper is she ingests it, that goes into her bloodstream, that goes into her liver, and she stores it in her liver. She then releases that copper from the liver into the blood to control the concentration of blood, uh, of copper in the blood. What she's not doing is if we're oversupplying, she's not excreting massively extra into her urine or feces. So she's building that liver copper status. And that is what I wanted to talk about in terms of looking at dairy cows all the way through from calves 
to them entering the milking herd, to them having their own calves, et cetera, et cetera, because copper is generally oversupplied to dairy cows in the UK. So while it's essential as a mineral, and I'll definitely have some herds that absolutely need to supplement, and we need to get the balance right between that under and oversupply because it's tight for copper, but it does have negative effects if it's oversupplied. So this is just an example uh, paper from Nigel Kendall at Nottingham showing liver copper concentrations in cool cows and that they, a lot of those cool cows had liver copper concentrations that were indicative of toxicity and therefore showed us that those cows had received too much copper up to that point of slaughter. Now, I think what we're starting to break down in terms of understanding is why that's happening where we're seeing those high coppers in terms of lifetime in the herd and certainly some of the data is showing us that oversupplying copper does have a negative effect on the fertility of that animal and potentially some data starting to show us that it also starts to impede performance in terms of milk yield in terms of growth rates so what I really want to suggest around copper is that you look at it in a, in terms of a whole herd thing because of the way that it accumulates in the liver if we oversupply calves which by the way when they're functioning as monogastrics not ruminants when they're small they absorb copper really really well in that stage and then that starts to tail off in terms of their capacity to absorb copper through their life but if we if they're born with a high copper status because the hat cow has a high copper status and then we take them through and we feed them lots of milk replacer which has minerals in it and then we're feeding them starter cake and then we take them through and try and grow them rapidly as young stock then we enter the milking herd and perhaps the milking diet is also a little bit too high in copper. We quickly reach a situation where those cows are much higher in terms of their liver copper concentration than they should be. And we could be impeding performance. So what I spend a lot of my time looking at is copper concentrations in the milking herd diet. But I think we really need to start to peel that back and look at how we're formulating across different um, sections of animals throughout throughout their lifetime. And that's what I'm just going to mention is iodine, because we do see a bit of oversupply of iodine. Iodine is really responsive in terms of the amount of iodine that we supply to a cow is the correlated with her milk iodine concentration. This is just the paper that I've uh, pulled out from this year. Um, but we there's lots and lots of papers that indicate to us that the same thing. I could have pulled out lots of different ones that would give a very, very similar graph showing how responsive the feed iodine concentration affects milk iodine concentration. And I guess what I see across the UK in this is quite a lot of variability in terms of what people are formulating on iodine. But we do see lots of herds that are being fed among above the recommended iodine intake. Sometimes there's a reason for that. So the iodine does have some antagonists that I'm not going to go massively into because I'll go much further into those when we talk about outwintering. But a lot of the time, I think we see excess iodine where maybe we don't and milk's the major excretory pathway for iodine so we're going to directly impact the iodine concentration in milk and that means that when we go to the supermarket and we're buying from one retailer if they're coming off a certain farm that might be a different iodine content to another one if they're buying off a different farming a uh, different farm or a different farming system so I'm not saying that that's always a bad thing because humans obviously clearly have a requirement for iodine and a lot of us get a lot of our iodine from dairy products, but definitely something to, to bear in mind and something that's probably going to have greater focus from a human point of view over the next few years and therefore might impact how we start to formulate iodine and iodine requirements for cows on farm.
So that was primarily focused around dairy because dairy is where I see most of the oversupply. So let's talk about a few specific requirements for beef cattle. And beef cattle, I think one of the things to be careful about is actually undersupply. So are we meeting the requirement of those animals, particularly where we've got um, big daily live weight gains? We're asking a lot of those animals in terms of performance. We're asking them to put on a lot of muscle every day. And we need to think about whether we're meeting their requirement or whether actually we're holding them back a little bit because of their mineral status. So what I would like to see on beef farms is much more consideration of data under supply, mineral auditing, making sure that we're meeting requirement at all those stages across production. If we're aiming to finish cattle as quickly as possible or we're aiming to do it slower, looking at the individual requirements for those different systems and also looking at some of those minerals that we may be related to response. So certainly within some of the um, continental breeds where we've got more muscle, looking at things like antioxidant status, looking at selenium, looking at vitamin E and some of the roles that they can play in making sure that we get rapid growth, but we also maintain healthy animals within that. So yeah, a little bit less specific on individual minerals for beef but a, a general call that we do see a lot of undersupply and I think we can we can improve performance of these animals if we start to break down the data and look at their mineral requirement more clearly. Now clearly what I've just said is there is a caveat to that because we've now obviously got a lot more beef cattle coming from the dairy industry and I've just talked about some of those warnings around calves coming off dairy cows that may be high in status. And that is th those warnings are going to apply if you're buying in uh, beef calves that are coming from a dairy that are potentially got high liver copper concentrations. Definitely a, a consideration and something to look at amongst this mineral audit and data as to how we say this is the requirement for these because perhaps we think they're not of normal status and therefore we need to monitor and change depending on that situation. Specific requirements for dry cows so talking specifically I guess on some of that over supplementation more to do with the actual lactating cows or a little bit in young stock but when we're talking about specific requirements for dry cows thinking about primarily control of calcium metabolism and how we actually get a cow moving its calcium supply from bone to milk um, as soon as she calves or increasing her absorption of calcium out of the diet as soon as she calves, allowing her to mobilize that calcium and avoid milk fever and everything associated with milk fever. And we've got lots of ways of doing that. So you've got farms using DCAD or dietary cation anion difference. We've got farms formulating low calcium diets. That depends on whether you've got an ability to control your calcium and control your potassium within those diets. And also, I guess, a significant number of farms starting to look at using things like binders. As a, a, as a way of reducing calcium and phosphorus within that dry cow diet to help the cow start to mobilize calcium as soon as she calves. So there's some specific requirements of dry cows. And that is a really an area, I would say, of rapidly growing research. A lot of new research coming out of America indicating perhaps some new ways that we understand calcium metabolism, how a cow mobilizes calcium, what might be beneficial in terms of letting blood calcium drop and come back up. Um, that would be a whole webinar in itself if I went into that, but certainly a, a really exciting area, I think, where again, we're starting to look at how the animal actually responds to its mineral status and whether we start to manipulate that to get a response in terms of milk yield 
later in lactation. Um, but yeah, so look out for some lots of exciting new data coming on around calcium metabolism, absorption, milk fever, that sort of thing, particularly out of uh, the US. Considering vitamin requirements for dry cows. So one of the things that it has been updated in the new requirements of dry cows in 2021 is vitamin E. And looking at vitamin E status with regard to antioxidants, removal of toxins from the body, helping to the cows in terms of fighting mastitis and things like that. And obviously also considering your, your trace mineral requirements within that during that dry cow period. And this would be the same whether we're talking dairy or whether we're talking beef thinking about pregnancy as a time when the cow is passing minerals from herself to the calf and we want that calf to be born of adequate mineral status so the closer that we can be in terms of getting those requirements right for the cow through pregnancy the better off that that calf will be when that calf is born So this is just the last slide in terms of there's so much ongoing research in this area, still not as much as I would like there to be, because doing the actual trials, looking at how minerals are absorbed, how they're metabolized, looking at absorption coefficients, all that data, which would be amazing to have for more minerals than we have it for, is really expensive. But we are starting to see it develop in some areas. So knowledge is advancing, but probably not as quickly as it used to be. Lots of knowledge advancing with regard to mineral source, lots of knowledge advancing with regard to, to calcium metabolism, but probably not so much in terms of how different minerals are absorbed. But we are seeing a little bit. Some research developing in response. But so, for example, definitely some research developing around chromium, around zinc, and how we might be able to get animals to respond to those different minerals. So to conclude, Ensure that you're meeting recommended mineral intakes. Hopefully I've kind of explained what I mean by a recommended mineral intake rather than a requirement and why I have not used the word requirement there. Um, but also consider response with regard to performance for some minerals alongside economic consideration. But my major take home specifically for dairy would be do not oversupply into the range where you may negatively affect performance or have considerable environmental excretion. Brilliant, thank you very much, Annie. That was a really insightful um, webinar into what you're seeing in terms of mineral nutrition in house cattle and what research is currently doing, which is obviously really vital for us on the commercial farms to get that information about what minerals doing to the cow and how that over supplement can affect her performance. Um, so we've got a couple of questions that have come in. So I'll just go through those. Um, so talking about the kind of oversupply and obviously Liam Sinclair's paper was 10 years ago and he talked about those minerals that were oversupplied then. Are we still seeing that today on commercial farms? Do you think that's still a major problem, the minerals that he identified back then 10 years ago? Yeah, unfortunately, yes. I think I think we have probably made some movement. I think it'd be unfair to say nothing's happened because I've certainly seen a reduction in phosphorus supply onto farm. And to be fair, a lot of that's been driven by the feed compounders reducing the, um, the amount of phosphorus that they're putting into to compound feed which then obviously goes as part of the, the ration so I think it'd be unfair to say we haven't seen any change but there's still a lot of oversupply and perhaps we haven't seen the rate of change that we would like to see and I think I think that's because mineral nutrition is complex and so to get it across in a way that has mass uptake across all the different systems that we have in the UK is really challenging. But there are there are some minerals, and I've obviously spoken a lot about copper tonight, uh, where I do think we still need fundamental change in terms of how much we're supplying 
into particularly these what we would consider whatever we want to call them high performing high yielding mm-hmm. intensive however we phrase it herds where yeah we have got systemic i would say problems in terms of cows being of too high a status okay brilliant remember if you want to ask any questions to pop it in the q a at the bottom of your screen um in part of your talk you mentioned minerals affecting milk solids which minerals help or impede the butter fat levels in particular the so this this data a lot of this has come out of the us because the way that their milk contracts work tend to be a lot more focused around solids um so the the data that i was referring to primarily is around chromium and some of the response because it's not a requirement the response that we might get from supplementing chromium giving us higher milk solids so that would be the research that i was referring to but clearly when we're talking about you know how we derive milk solids and taking that right back to what's happening in the rumen and fiber digestion and all sorts of things like that there are lots of different ways that we could change the way that the animal digests those fiber sources depending on whether we've got mineral nutrition right but yeah the research that i would be referring to would be around chromium okay and which mineral deficiencies or signs are most common when cattle come inside for the winter i think the most common phone call that i get is my cows are licking metal they're chewing everything they are why are they doing that Um, so and that that can definitely be a a sign of a mineral imbalance i'm not going to call it a mineral deficiency because quite often it isn't that severe it's quite often a a mineral imbalance and we can relate that there are so many different minerals that that could be that could be sodium could be phosphorus it could be selenium that's causing that but that's probably the the one that i get the most phone calls about in terms of cows coming in for winter and a, a change in diet it's thinking about what may have caused their status to drop over the previous period so when we were grazing them which of those minerals may be lower than we would like it to be when those cows come in and you know generally across the board the first thing that we'll see is a drop in performance and I know that's a little bit not specific and that makes it hard to identify which mineral is actually causing the problem, which is why I'd go back to looking at my audit, looking at the history of the cows, what have they been on, which, which thing might be causing me a problem and go down the, the diagnostics route if we need to. But yeah, generally what we get first is poor performance. And then if we let that continue, we might see things that are more specific to different minerals. So we might see things that say, or fertility that we might go yeah that's a little, looking a little bit more specifically like it's to do with selenium or we might go actually you know what these car these cows are calving and these calves are a nightmare um maybe they are not very quick to get up and that sort of thing we might go back and look at iodine but the general thing that we would see first is these cows are not performing how we'd expect them to be Okay. And that leads us really nicely into this next question. So which system of mineral supplementation at grass is best to ensure that smooth transition indoors? It's a really, yeah, tricky question because, so the the best supplement is always the one that fits your system, but supplementing at grass is challenging because how do we ensure that we get regular intake of minerals that aren't stored particularly well in the body so things like iodine the animal doesn't have massive storage for that so we need to be supplying it regularly and that can be challenging when they're grazing my go-to on a grazing system would always be a bolus because a bolus gives us hopefully supply every day for the life of that bolus for however long that bolus is designed to last for 
but I put some major caveats around that in that not all boluses on the market are the same. Mm. Not all boluses will last how long they are designed to last for. Not all boluses will supply the right amount of mineral each day. So I would go back and make sure that you're asking for the data, making sure that you're asking the manufacturer for the evidence that the bolus is going to do what you want it to do. My second caveat around boluses is to think of them in terms of your long-term plan. So if you're using them in a grazing system and you bolus in August, but you've got cows coming in on in October and you intend to supplement them in a house system, mm-hmm. you've then got an overlap between that bolus still being in the rumen and releasing mineral and you feeding that mineral to those housed animals. Now, sometimes that's unavoidable. And practically, there's not always something that we can do about it, but we should be aware of it and think about it within with, within those sort of risks. Now, there's other options. There's uh, injectables, there's drenches, there is buckets and licks, but I think all of those have their, their downside in terms of how long they last, whether we get regular intake, if we're going to drench that's quite labor intensive because we've got to do that quite often so we'll talk a little bit about different supplementary um, forms in the sort of extensive outwintering webinar because it is, it is challenging it does make it more difficult uh, in terms of identifying what is the right supplement for me to use yeah so it's it's a tricky one at times to figure out what's the best way to do it um, and just one final question um, where would you like research to go next in terms of minerals and house systems? I think in an ideal world, what we need to see is more of those minerals that we can identify as this is absolutely what these cows require versus what we're saying is effectively we've looked at all the data and we've come up with this is our best I'm not going to say guess because guess would be unfair, but this is our best conclusion from that data. Mm-hmm. But that data is not good enough for us to say this is absolutely what those cows require. So in an ideal world, if we could move to a stage where we've got more of those minerals that sit within, this is what we know and this is what affects them and this is what our requirement is, then that would be better. But yeah, definitely an area where that is challenging because like I say those studies are really expensive yes well thank you very much Annie that has been a really insightful webinar into kind of the requirements in-house systems for cattle but also the challenges of getting it right and making sure we do get it right for all the cattle that are housed Um, just before everyone heads off and we finish this webinar thank you all for joining tonight i hope that has been a useful and insightful webinar for yourselves our next webinar and the final one in our series of this of this set of webinars is on wednesday the 6th of november and in that one we will be as annie has said we will be looking at the outwintering systems and what mineral requirements are required in both dairy and beef cattle. Okay, thank you very much.